I'm Bill Dutton. I'm, I'm the director of the Oxford Internet Institute, and I just want to welcome everybody here. This is not the OII. This is the Oxford E Research Center. But uh, every time we have a really great event, we, we're too large to fit in the OII. So uh, anyway, uh, uh, we really want to thank the OERC for letting us use their facilities. First, uh, we're co-hosting this, obviously, OII with the Family Online Safety Institute. I want to thank uh, Fosse for uh, agreeing to do this. Actually, uh, uh, it was your suggestion, and I really appreciate that. It just has worked out magnificently. We're really impressed with the audience we have today. I mean, uh, so we're hoping to get to Q&A. There's so many people in this room that are absolutely centrally <coughs> involved in the issues we're going to be talking about. Let me also thank uh, sponsors who will make a reception possible and uh, have helped with the expenses of, the, of this uh, event, the Vodafone Group, uh, Fox Interactive Media, and also MySpace. We're uh, very lucky to have you supporting this event. Um, I'm not going to say anything about the speakers because I'd like uh, Stephen Balcom to introduce uh, the speakers. Uh, he is the founder and CEO of uh, the Family Online Safety Institute, and, uh, and, and it was our conversation that led to this, but it was not my work. Uh, Vicki Nash of the OII worked with Stephen, and if, if it works out successfully, uh, this is uh, all to Vicki's credit and Stephen's. Uh, Stephen will introduce uh, our speakers and chair the Q&A. Uh, I just want to point out that we will be recording, as you can obviously see. Uh, the event so that this will be uh, hopefully on our webcast site in due course. Uh, and uh, thank you again for coming. I want to thank the speakers. This is absolutely a great opportunity. Thank you very much. Well, thanks very much, Bill, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming out. This is uh, a tremendous, uh, tremendous turnout. Um, I want to thank the OII for agreeing to, to this event. Um, so I was here in February and I had uh, a delightful lunch with Jonathan Sutrain, who's sitting at the back, and um, over a dish of roly-poly pudding, uh, I just said to him, "So, what, you know, when, when are you next in in DC?" And he said, "Well, about three weeks' time." So, in three weeks later, we had a book launch uh, for Jonathan's new book, um, "The Future of the Internet and How to Stop It." And just because of that title alone, you should rush out and buy it. It's a it's a fantastic read. Um, I've known Bill now, I think, since 2001. A, a huge admir admiration for the Institute and what it has achieved and the incredible sort of stellar cast of, uh, of staff that you, you've gathered here. Um, so the Family Online Safety Institute is an international nonprofit organization. Uh, we have staff both here in uh, the UK as well as in the States. Um, and our mission, I mean, basically the, the fundamental premise is to try and make the online world safer for kids while also respecting free expression. So it's that interesting dynamic tension between protection of speech and protection of kids. Um, we bring together thought leaders in government, in industry, in the nonprofit sector to collaborate and to innovate in this space um, at an international level. And tonight is a very good example of just that. So there's quite an interesting, you know, multicultural mix, uh, people from different sectors, uh, and we're going to continue this conversation in a, uh, a roundtable tomorrow to, to get even deeper into the issues. So I have great pleasure in introducing our, our speakers tonight. Um, uh, first of all, I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Tanya Byron, who many of you will know is uh, a broadcaster here, a journalist, um, a mental health consultant, and um, her TV credentials, if I'm getting this right, include Little Angels, House of Tiny Tearaways, and even Am I Normal? Uh, which I'm sure she can answer for herself. Um, Tanya also finds time to do a bit of comedy on the side with French and Saunders, yep, and has published three books on child behavior and is working on an encyclopedia on child development. Uh, she writes a, a weekly column for The Times, and on top of all of that, she's a mother of two kids, who no doubt provide her with ample material, as my two kids do, uh, for the work that I do. Um, next, we have John Palfrey, who is currently the clinical professor of law at Harvard Law School, and executive director of the Berkman Center. Uh, he is also chairman of the Internet Technical Task Force set up by MySpace and the uh, state attorney generals in the United States to consider tools and methods <coughs> to protect kids uh, in social networking sites 
specifically in the internet more generally. And um, I too serve on that task force as do some of my board members here, Mike McCann from Verizon and Brent Olson from AT&T. And we can attest to the task that John has taken on and the um, considerable diplomatic skills that he employs with the 30 of us sitting on that task force. And finally, uh, Annie Mullins, who is uh, Vodafone's global head of content standards. Um, I've known ten, uh, Annie for a good 10 years at least, uh, going back to your days with Yahoo and the National Children's Home. I know her to be a passionate advocate uh, for kids, uh, and, but also in the wide range of online safety issues that we're going to address tonight. Um, before I go any further, uh, please switch off uh, your cell phones, laptops, pacemakers, whatever, you know, buzzes. No, no. no okay, okay. I, that was, I, I threw that in just to make sure you were paying attention. Um, so the order of play for tonight is, first we're going to hear from Tanya, um, then immediately afterwards um, we've asked John to give a brief response, and immediately after that we've asked Annie also to respond. Annie also has a short video, is that right? For us to have a look at. Um, so um, finally, I just want to say that um, I first met Tanya in February in London, um, just before, or I think there was about a month to go before the review was published. And also it had some telephone conversations as well. I was very struck by her extraordinary grasp of the very wide range of complex issues that online safety throws up. Because not only does it throw up issues to do with child protection, but it's also areas around child development, but then there's public policy, and it is an international medium, as you all know, and therefore what you're doing in the UK will have an impact elsewhere, as obviously the rest of the world will impact on what's going on here. Um, I think that one of, the, uh, one of the best reports that has ever been produced on this subject was the Byron Review, which I know many of you will have. <laughs> if you haven't, I know that it's available online. I would highly recommend, at the very least, reading the executive summary because it is a, a tremendous piece on that. So um, without any further ado, Tanya? I published um, two reviews, um, one for the grown-ups, which is 264 pages, and one for the kids, which is 16 pages. And which one do you think gives you the clearer picture? <laughs> <laughs> so download that one. Um, thank you very much for your kind words. Stephen, um, and thank you very much for asking me to come here today, and it's a pleasure to meet you all and to have, I'm <coughs> sure, a really great conversation. Um, this morning, um, my children asked me what I was doing today, and I had to, uh, earlier with the lovely John Carr, I was speaking at the NSPCC conference and about this subject and then coming here, and I said, oh, I'm talking about the review that I did for the Prime Minister, and they went, oh, roll their eyes on the Byron review. I said, yes, yeah. <laughs> and my 10-year-old son, Jack, said, um, Mummy, have you actually read it since you wrote it? And I said, no. And he went, oh, this is going to be a good one. So anyway, <laughs> I read the 16 pages on the train. <laughs> I also bought uh, Claudine Menasha jones who's going to be part of uh, the panel tomorrow, who is an extraordinary young woman um, who I was very lucky to have as my team lead when I was doing the review. And I, I'm very proud is now leading the implementation of Byron, as it's called. I can't tell you how sick I am of my surname. Um, but anyway, um, and she will be um, very important to help us all think beyond Byron, what's happening next. Um, I know that this is being filmed for YouTube, and I, I was thinking, well, how, how do I want to present this, and who will the YouTube audience be? And I think, really, I, I want to present it by telling, I think telling the story of the review would be the most useful thing to do, if that sounds like a good idea to everybody in the room. If I see any of you slide into a coma with boredom, I'll, I'll think of something else. Annie and I have got a sort of song and dance routine kind of set up if it gets really dull. One of the most surreal moments of my life was last uh, summer, sitting in the back garden of number 10 with Gordon Brown, with him saying, um, so would you like to do a, this review for me? My, and my head slightly swimming, and I, I sort of thought about it, and it wasn't really very good timing for me. I'd just been commissioned to write a book and various things, and was finishing off a series, but thought, actually, I think I might want to move things to do this, because it felt like an extraordinary privilege to be asked. But also, and this is the more honest answer, as, as a mother of a 10-year-old and a 13-year-old daughter, I just felt that actually this would be incredibly useful to me as a parent. And so I walked into this review knowing very, very little and full of the anxieties that I know so many adults feel about 
their children interacting and using the internet in, in, in order to, to learn, to communicate, to socialize, and so on. Six months later, I feel like I've had a rebirth. Mm -hmm. And so I just thought it would be useful to talk about the process. When I first started thinking about the review, I realized that in six months, I would never have the level of expertise, technical <coughs> or policy expertise, to really be able to stand and make the sorts of recommendations that could be intricate in the way that would be meaningful to move on, particularly amongst those who've been working in this field for such a long time. But what I do know, and what I've been doing for over 20 years in the health service, is working with children, young people, and families. And as a child development specialist and an academic in this area, I felt that actually the voice that I should be representing and the way I should be thinking is from the perspective of the child, the child and the young person. And particularly this was because I knew the amount of prejudice that I brought to the subject when I started. And I was so aware of this digital generational divide where, as Mark Prince... <coughs> Sorry. As Mark, that's, was that, uh, the, that was like you got two minutes left. <laughs> Mark Prensky said in 2001, and everybody in the room knows this, but I love it, you know, we are the digital immigrants and they are the digital natives. And definitely when I watch my own children online, I see that very much. So in order to feel confident and competent, I continue to be a clinical psychologist in my approach to, to this review. And it was really interesting to see how much my skills in working with very dysfunctional and anxious systems um, were very key to me managing this review and steering it in, in a positive way. So when I walked in, the first thing that I was met by was a tsunami of anxiety amongst all stakeholders. Initially, who are you and what do you want and not another one? And do you know how many people like you across government we have to talk to? And it's getting really confusing and difficult. And by the way, what do you know about these industries? What do you know about us? Absolutely fair points to make. And, and secondly, a real sense of fatigue amongst <laughs> all stakeholders at the same questions being asked in the same way over and over again, really fueled by a moral panic that seems to be around about these new technologies. And interestingly, and again, many of you will know this, that, that any new technology or any new innovation, going even back to the printing press and Caxton, is met by moral panic. There is a fear of what is this going to do? What are words going to do when they're printed on a page and people can read them? What is the telephone going to do to women? Apparently it was going to be a moral contagion to women. We, was, we, were going to be, <laughs> we were going to be bad mothers. We were going to be bad mothers because of using the telephone. Maybe they were right, I don't know. The waltz even. There was a big article in the Times many, many, many years ago saying, don't let your daughters do this dance. They'll become whatever, prostitutes, whatever. So while risk is an incredibly important issue and we always have to be anxious and aware of that, the anxiety that I was perceiving was anxiety that went beyond what I would say was within the normal limits of concern. It went into areas of, um, as I said, fatigue, paranoia, and sometimes when I was sitting in the early meetings and just observing, I was seeing relationships being played out amongst different partners, different players in these industries, across government, um, in the third sector, in law enforcement, that just <coughs> reflected the fact that actually everybody wanted the same outcome, but everybody felt very entrenched in their position and felt that it was almost becoming a fight. It reminded me of working with a family who all wanted to stay together, but everybody in the room was going, no, it's your fault, no, it's yours, well, you did that and he did this. So for me, that was the first, that was the first piece of work. And that made me feel pretty good because I could be a clinical psychologist, I could manage the system. What I felt was really important, particularly because I was very upfront from the outset, I am not an expert, was to make the process as transparent as possible and to engage all stakeholders. So the process was 100 individual stakeholder meetings, three separate stakeholder workshops, one for industries associated to the internet, one for the third sector for charities and so on, and one for the video games industry because I also did some work around video games. And then after Christmas, once my call for evidence had closed and we, myself and the team had had a chance to evaluate all the responses that were coming in, I held an interim conference where I then brought everybody together in mixed groups and we spent the day debating some of the key issues that were coming out, particularly what parents and children were saying. So I was kind of saying, this is what we're hearing, and then we was 
getting back, what do you think? What's the direction of travel that you want to see this going in? And, it, and these were difficult times because there, there has been a deal of anxiety throughout the process and I wanted to be able to preserve my independence as an independent reviewer, which meant that I had to be really careful not to engage too specifically with different stakeholders and then lose a sense of the whole system. This is a real systemic piece. When I uh, first of all published my call for evidence, I did one for adults and then I did a call for evidence for children. And when I got all the responses back, in total, I got more responses from children and young people than all the responses from adults. So the voice of the child is very much reflected <coughs> in this. And given that they are the, uh, the natives and we are the immigrants, I felt it was only fair to ask them what they thought, what the issues were. And in fact, the most sensible and rational responses often I got were from children. One of my favorite responses was from a little nine-year-old boy who said to me, the thing is, I really, really like the internet but I'm really scared I'm going to get lost on it, and one day I'll find I've got, like, a job in the army or something. <laughs> <laughs> and you just, you know, you stand and you think, that is very sensible, because what you're saying is, here I am, a little person, in this big, exciting place, and I want to explore. It's a bit like being a, the, the new kid at school. I want to go through that door. I want to go down that corridor. I want to go and play with the big boys. <coughs> but what can I do, and what can't I do? And when I asked him more and other children about that, because we, we did a lot of consultation with children's panels, what they said was, we don't know who to ask, so we kind of work it out on our own. Because if we ask our mum and dad, they tend not to know. And it was really interesting when I reflected back to being a child and how I used to set the video recorder if mum and dad wanted a program taped. So these kids are installing the filtering software or uninstalling it, as, as, uh, as it might be. And so for me, there was a, there was the, the digital generational divide was a big, big issue. And then I started thinking, has this review just come at a very specific time in the history of digital technology development? Give it a few years, and these kids will be parents. And of course, technology will have moved on rapidly, but they will have the self-efficacy. They will have the understanding and the belief that they can engage with their children and discuss it with them. Anyway, I put that to one side, flew to the States, met lots of people in America, came back thinking, right, where do I go from here? And actually, what I felt very strongly was that I really needed to address the principal issue of what is the internet for when it comes to children? What do they value? And what kids really value, I mean, oh yeah, I use it to do my homework, Dr. Byron. Yeah, of course you do. They value communication, they value games, they value socialising and so on. And as I thought about it, and I was reflecting on this moral panic, and I was thinking about the, the notion of risk, and thinking about how important the experience of risk is for children. Age-appropriate, managed risk is a very important experience for children. And it really struck me how we have these children, as Tim Gill said in 2007, being raised in captivity. Kids don't play like I used to play. We don't let our kids outside. You can't even climb a tree in a school. You're not allowed to play conkers or, or throw snowballs. You go to these, uh, these play areas and they have these spongy floors. You know what I mean? I mean you know, where you don't, you, there were armies of kids on bicycles outside houses going around the streets when I grew up. Nothing. It's a ghost town. And so if we are so paranoid offline about risk to our children, what do we do? We keep them indoors. And by keeping them indoors, we then push them to places where they can socialize, they can communicate, and they can take risks. And the only way you can do that if you're inside is to do it online. So perversely, we've created a risk-averse culture that stops our children doing what children do, which are developmental imperatives, particularly risk-taking. We think we're keeping them safe by keep keeping them in the house, and there they are, taking risks in this global space without anybody supervising them, managing them, or even talking to them about what they're doing. Because many parents believe that when their children are online, it's the same as their children watching television. So when I first wrote the beginnings of the piece and started to talk about the fact that actually when your child is online, it's the same as opening the front door to your house and saying, go on then, see you later. <coughs> That's when in our focus groups that we ran, the parents started panicking. What do you mean? What do you mean? It, isn't it like television? No, television is a regulated space. This is an unregulated space. So then anxiety leads to the fight or flight response. So you get a group of parents saying, we're going to shut it all down and switch it off. <coughs> Deny the opportunities to their children that, that they would get from this. Or you get the parents who withdraw and say, oh, no, it's fine. I trust them. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. Now... I do believe in freedom of speech, and I do love the way that the internet has democratized information. 
the, the generation of information, the gathering of information, the sharing of information, the way that in the Web 2.0 space, we see the most incredible content being created by very young minds as well as by adults. And I felt that, that, was the, that it was so important that that had to be preserved, but it had to be preserved <coughs> in a way that enables young people to use it at, the, that was safe. And if we have this digital generational divide and we can't educate people straight away, what are we going to do? Some people were very resistant and have been very resistant to the notion of any talk, of any measures around safety. You know, some people are very, very clear that this is a, a truly, this is the Wild West, it's a truly democratic space, it's untouched, it is what it is, and, you know, we must leave it that way. And I have to say, when it comes to kids and it comes to safety, I don't buy that. I think there is a, there, the beauty of the net, everything that I've said, is extraordinary. But when children are going into chat rooms and having innocent conversations <coughs> and being caught up in a web of, of, of real problem behaviour because no parent has actually thought to help them think about the fact that actually that person who says they're a child might not be because the internet is you know, anonymous when we have kids clicking into things and coming across stuff that may not damage them for life but is very, very distressing. When we have, for example, we know that about between 60 and 70% of 14-year-old boys will have access to pornography. It's normal, it's natural. You know, you all did it, I'm sure. Maybe before the internet, I don't know what it was. Maybe it was National Ge Geographic, I don't know. But anyway, it's part of, it's part of the development of, of young people. I'm sorry, look, it, so it was for these gentlemen. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I do apologise, I don't know them. Um, it, but when you look at the kind of pornography that children can access on the net, it, is, it takes you into a whole other area of thinking about how is this going to impact on young people's attitudes and beliefs? What, kind, what are they seeing? <coughs> and so on. So it was, it, was, it, was, it was a very, very difficult call to make. What kids were saying is, the more you tell us not to go there, we're going to go there. And I thought, yeah, that makes sense. I was a kid myself once. So the more you say keep out, we'll go in. Okay? They were saying, the more you do this from a top-down perspective, you impose this on us, we will find ways of getting around it. Because do you know what? We know it better than you. So you can lock things off and nail things down, but we'll still find our way through. And I, there was an example in Australia recently where a 14-year-old, was it 14? I can't remember, went straight through a sort of a network-level blocking system. Do you know why? It wasn't because he was tech savvy. It's because he guessed his mother's security PIN number. So, you know... We have to be creative, we have to be courageous, and we have to be innovative in the way that we think about how children can stay safe online. Now, just to bore you very quickly, a um, bit of showing off, but from a developmental perspective, I commissioned three literature reviews. I had the Media Effects Review from David Buckingham, Professor David Buckingham, Institute of In um, Education. But then I had two academics um, who, who I commissioned reviews around child development and brain development because I felt I wanted to sort of put an end to this kind of notion that maybe it wasn't the right thing to impose any sort of safety standards in this space. And fundamentally, there are, there are some very important things that we just have to acknowledge. And it's a bit of a no-brainer, because for kids, the offline world and the online world are one and the same thing. I start being bullied at school, I get back and it's all over social networking sites, or it's all over my IM, you know, people are IMing and saying mean things about me. It's the same thing. So for them, it's all on the same page, the offline and the online world. And we as parents and adults have to not see the online world as a separate thing. It's all part of parenting, it's all part of education. It, ha it, it just cuts through the fabric of our children's lives and we have to support and enable that as well. Children lack the ability to critically evaluate content, context, and conduct until they are about five years old. And that is because the frontal cortex of the brain, in terms of neural networks, is not fully connected until a child is about four or five years old. And we know that. Little ones sitting with grandma, hand down pants, you know, scratching themselves, finger up their nose, <laughs> looking around. You know, they don't understand impulse control. They don't understand the context of where they are. They don't have a sense of, of appropriate social behavior. In the offline world, what do we do? We put locks on the drawers in the, in, the, uh, in the kitchen. We have the locks on the front door high up so they can't run out into the street, <coughs> that sort of thing. So with little ones, it's really important that we have very clear mechanisms to be, to be very clear about what they can do and they can see and what they can't. But as children get older, we want to enable 
them to be independent. We want to foster a sense of an ability to identify, assess and to manage risk. And so we start to take our children outside. We show them how to cross the road. We then let them walk beside us. Eventually, we stand on the other side of the road and our child will walk to us. And eventually, with our hearts racing, and I remember the first time my kids did this, they go off merrily with their pocket money on their own to the sweet shop on a Saturday morning. And for 10 agonizing minutes, you're thinking, oh, and then they come back and they feel like they rule the world. And eventually, 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 their independence increases. And for me, this is very similar to what we should be doing in terms of parenting our children in the online space. It starts with very clear monitoring. It starts with very clear supervision. But then it is a collaborative dialogue, a collaborative process between parent and child, <coughs> educator and child, around responsible behavior, around safe behavior, around what it is to understand and manage risk, with us also accepting that children will take risks. I was um, very impressed um, by the work of Adam Thera and I was particularly impressed with his notion of a swimming pool. And I took that and kind of embellished it a bit, but I definitely credited him with it. But the notion of a swimming pool, I think, is a very useful way to help people understand this. We have a swimming pool, which is a place of enormous benefit, but it's also a place of possible risk. We have shallow ends for beginners, and we have deep ends for people who can swim. So we have filters to put in place to keep the beginners in the shallow end where we know they're going to be okay, and those expert swimmers, the older kids, the kids who have a sense of responsibility, who can navigate these digital waters, they have a, a largely or wholly unfiltered space. We have lifeguards at pools, we have moderators on, on sites, we have floats, we have ways to enable people to learn to swim, we have all sorts of access programs, information that people can use to think about how they use this space. We also have safety signs, information signs saying, no petting is the one that's come into my head. Is, is, do you remember that one? I don't know if they still have it. And there's a girl and a boy in hearts. Um, no petting in the swimming pool and no running and other things like that, no jumping on people's heads. Well, we have information and safety signs in the online space as well. But at the end of the day, when we lock the swimming pool up and we put the alarms on and we close everything down, there still might be those few kids who will manage to get through and who will wander in and who will fall in. So we all also teach our children how to swim. And that, for me, is very much the piece. It's about using the available technologies, but it's also about empowering parents and adults and educators to really think about how they can embrace the challenge of online parenting in a way that they may not have the efficacy around what their children are doing, but they can take the very simple me messages that we do give our children around offline world risk in terms of the online. I challenged government to, um, to finance an information campaign, an education campaign about that, which, which they said yes to. I've also challenged government, the third sector and industry, to <coughs> develop a model, an excellent model of good practice, the Home Secretary's Task Force, which I believe had its last meeting today, so we should maybe have a moment's silence. But um, to move from that into something which will be a, a UK Child Internet Safety Council. It will be set up and reports to the Prime Minister annually, so there is a sense of buy-in. It will have a cross-departmental secretariat, so none of the fatigue that I know so, so many in the industry felt of different departments with different agendas having cross-conversations that actually made many people in the industry feel like they were just treading water. So there will be a joined-up sense of working together. It will have a board of, of, of key stakeholders, and then it will have... Uh, two dis distinct strands, one about systems and policy and one about delivery. And on the delivery strand, I've recommended that, that there is an independent person who will oversee the implementation of the strategy and the policy because you can't spend three years talking about something. This is about children and safety. We've got to think about it, we've got to talk about it, and we've got to deliver on it. And I, I was very impressed by the guidelines that the Home Secretary's Task Force have, have laid out for a number of different things, you know, for moderation, and there's the recent social networking guidelines and so on. These are fantastic guidelines. These are very, very lengthy documents, some of which took a very long time to produce, none of which really, I would say, are written for the public, so wouldn't actually educate adults or parents unless they had a sense of what they were doing. They're pretty difficult to get through unless you know what, even if you wanted to. Um, but also, what, did, what is meant by the notion of a guideline? I grew up in child protection, that's my job. If you, if you say that you are delivering good practice around child safety, which clearly will gloss a brand hugely, then that has to be evaluated, that has to be independently monitored 
in order to see that that is being delivered. And I realise that is probably the biggest challenge in my recommendations, but I don't believe it's insurmountable. And I, I do believe the stakeholders that I worked with, who I think by the end felt a real sense of ownership of this issue and coming together, can, can within the council find their way through on that. I think it's really important. There have been questions, is this a self-regulatory model or a co-regulatory model? I've said it's a self-regulatory model. I've seen the, the work of the council in terms of the key stakeholders thinking about the codes and, and the guidelines, the good practice guidelines, as being a specific self-regulatory strand. And the independent evaluation is something that then comes alongside that. Some people have argued that's co-regulation. For me, there is no... I have not recommended any legal penalty for not delivering against certain codes. I didn't think that was necessary. I felt that that was too, too stick. And I could see the people I'd worked with in the industry had a real sense of wanting to move forward with, with defining what it really is in good practice and how to deliver on it, although it's a very difficult task in such a huge creative space that is forever changing. I think that public censure of the council, either for not signing up to the codes or for not delivering on the codes, for the sort of brands that we're talking about here that people use mostly in the net, for me, was, was sufficient. That's why I described it as self-regulatory. Um, within this council, there will be a panel of parents and children. Where is their voice in all of this? They have a very loud voice in here. They need to have a very loud voice in terms of the <coughs> ongoing movement um, in this area. And there will be um, a research arm so that research, rather than play catch-up, can actually work alongside some of the thinking that needs to be done in terms of thinking about how we move on in this exciting space. There are some things that are difficult, but I don't think they're insurmountable. And fundamentally, when you're talking about children and safety, difficulty should be embraced and should be thought about robustly and assertively and not, I'm not pulled back from. So I have, I have set out a number of challenges which I may not be able to tell you specifically beyond Byron how they will actually finally show themselves. But for me, this is about the principles of child safety, the principles of freedom of speech, and the principle that actually we are doing what children and young people have said very clearly they think needs to be done. Amen. <laughs> Dr. Bryan, that was just brilliant, much like your report, and uh, a very, very hard act to follow, but something nice to respond to, so thank you for that. Um, to Stephen and Fossi, uh, thank you not just for today and organizing this, but for your leadership in this space overall. As I've embarked on the challenge of this task force with you and others, it's been great to have your guidance, and uh, I admire greatly the board that you've also pulled together, the members of industry from Verizon, AT&T, AOL, and others who have really stepped up to uh, participate and, and to be here. So thank you for that. And the OII for your leadership, Bill and Vicki and others, for bringing together this conversation. Of course, this is where tons of really good work gets done. And thank you for, for having me. Um, so I've been tasked with responding to this extraordinary report by Dr. Byron and also talking briefly about the Internet Safety Technical Task Force, which in the United States I chair. It has. Uh, elements of a parallel review to the Byron Report, but in many respects is quite different. Um, and if we are anywhere near as successful as you've been, um, we will count ourselves very, very lucky. Um, and then lastly, I want to turn to a few questions of implementation, because I think um, as well as we may perform in doing these reviews and writing reports as an academic, I love reports, of course, and books and so forth, um, we do have to think about how we make this meaningful. I think one of the great credits um, to your work is that it has flown into an implementation process so immediately and frankly, I think the recommendations you've put in place um, around hard issues do lend themselves to putting into place um, through concrete steps. So I want to turn to that. Um, for anybody who's read either the short form or the 264-page <coughs> version of the report, I think there are many things to, to commend it. Um, there are, uh, I think, um, some uh, mode issues that, that set this uh, report apart. First and foremost, I think this issue of protecting children online start and end with kids themselves, of course. And I think this is something that you did very, very well in this report, listening very carefully, of course, to the voices of children, weaving their voices through the report, and then thinking also about the things that kids themselves can do to be part of the solution. Um, and I think that's a very important starting and ending point. Um, I think the notion of 
conceiving this safety issue in a converged world, not just thinking of the online space as distinct from the offline, is totally essential. Um, I've been writing a book over the last few years with a colleague, Urs Gasser. Um, we've been in interviewing people from Europe and the United States, primarily young kids, um, and the book is called Born Digital. The idea has been um, to listen to lots of kids and then write up the policy issues, including safety. One of the things that hit us was no kid thinks of the online environment as different than life. It is part of life. It's all together. I think this is a, a core fundamental thing that you've brought through with this report and that it, um, it sings through your recommendations. Um, I think your discussions of video games, which you didn't mention, some of the rating ideas are, are excellent and something that um, I think are very um, actionable and something that uh, we should look at also uh, in the United States. Um, I think your emphasis on education as a series of uh, steps to, uh, to solve this issue and a process moving forward, series of councils and so forth, um, makes a lot of sense. Um, and I think ultimately you've pointed to a series of steps that we can take to make kids more safe online that are community-based solutions. The notion of having a number of different parties come to the table and work together. The pool makes a lot of sense as a metaphor when you think of it as a community space. These are networked public spaces that we're talking about, which relate to public spaces, and frankly, we're all in them together. There are at the table kids, there are parents and teachers and peers, there are companies who are in many um, cases like those involved here, MySpace and others, um, trusted partners, and then of course somewhere back there is law enforcement, is the government. Um, and I think you framed beautifully how these series series of partners can work together. And one of the implementation issues, Mike McCann mentioned this earlier, is where does the burden fall in terms of implementing the solution? Who pays? Who actually takes the lead? Clearly, some of it is all of us do. It's a community-based approach. But that doesn't mean that um, there aren't unequal burdens at different points and different things that people can do. Um, so I think the, the <coughs> report you've put together is a wonderful blueprint. It's extraordinarily helpful to us that you've gone ahead and done it first. Uh, and we're very grateful uh, for all the work that went into it. In terms of the work that's going on in the United States, very briefly, we're at a relatively early stage. The history here is that back in the beginning of this year, in January and February, the uh, 49 state attorneys general, so that's everybody but Texas in the United States, came uh, to uh, issue a joint statement. Sorry, do not mess with Texas. No, no, they have not been messed with here. Uh, the 49th State's Attorney General, with the um, exception of Texas, um, and led by Roy Cooper um, and Richard Blumenthal, two of the attorneys general, uh, issued a joint statement with my, uh, MySpace. And the joint statement uh, required uh, or mentioned that MySpace will do a series of things. But um, in particular, it created the, this task force, which um, we chair. And then there are about 30 members, so many of whom uh, are in the room. And the, the charge is something of a challenge, to be truthful. Um, the charge is to look at, for a period of not even a year, ending uh, in December, at a series of technologies to figure out whether they can help keep kids safe online. Um, and the issue of scope has been something that we have struggled with. I think we've, we've nailed it at this point, but, uh, but it's taken some time to get there. Um, the scope of the survey is to determine which kinds of technologies, and with age verification technologies as the sort of inner core, but then a larger circle of other technologies that may help, that may keep kids safe from a series of harms, mostly related to contact with strangers um, and content, but against a backdrop of realizing that things like peer-to-peer -peer cyberbullying and other um, concerns are also um, uh, safety issues for kids. Um, in the context primarily of social network sites, but um, with the internet uh, at large as uh, something that we realize is relevant. Um, and lastly, to do it in a way that's relevant to the 49 states, which have commissioned it, um, but recognizing also this is an international issue. And Bebo uh, and others who have international presences are part of our, uh, our task force. So at the core of it, we're looking at age verification technologies in social networks um, and uh, in the uh, United States context. But we're also recognizing that it's um, something of a broader frame. Um, the emphasis of our work between now and the end of the year really will be on analyzing technologies to try to determine whether or not there are good technological solutions that are part of this frame. Of course, much of your report um, 
deals with <coughs> other kinds of solutions. And so one of the things I think that's quite helpful about this is, though technologies are not a huge emphasis in your report, um, it is something we're looking at quite closely. And so there's sort of a jigsaw puzzle-like um, aspect to it. I also think much of Adam Thier's work, for instance, which um, deals with some of the things you've dealt with, also um, complement this. So as we think about how you keep kids safe online, recognizing there are a series of different approaches that these community-based um, members uh, ultimately uh, can bring together. Um, we will issue a report um, by the end of the year, so in theory by December 31st, uh, 2008, um, and I very much look forward to figuring out before we end, what are the next steps? What are the ways in which we can implement the kinds of recommendations that we come up with um, and how we can put it in the proper frame, recognizing that technologies are some of the solution to keeping kids safe, um, but that many of the things that you've raised and others have raised appropriately are uh, you know, potentially just as important, if not more so, uh, going forward. So uh, lastly, in terms of implementation, um, I think this is, of course, where the rubber hits the road in this incredibly intense, important, but really um, politically charged issue of keeping kids safe online. We can say education all we like, and I think everybody's going to agree that that's, that's crucially important. But I think the question around implementation is really going to be, um, how much can we, as a community, step up and do it in a self-regulatory way? Um, and how much is the state going to step in and force um, this to happen. Uh, um, Stephen mentioned Jonathan Zittrain's book, my great friend and closest colleague sitting here in the back, um, who's written a book called uh, The Future of the Internet and How to Stop It. Jonathan talks about a series of solutions that we can use in the internet um, that draw upon communities in very broad distributed ways to try to answer this problem. I think um, uh, as we were walking in, it's pretty clear that some of the things Jonathan can solve with his theory, things like spam and phishing and otherwise, um, probably won't be the way to solve this. This is uh, kind of an issue that is defying some of the theories um, that other academics have come up with in complex ways. And so as we go to the implementation, I think it is going to require a series of uh, different modes and that some of the most advanced academic theories, unfortunately, may not, um, may not ultimately help us out. Um, I think the issue of who takes the threads that we've developed in these reports and then pulls on them in a way to make the fabric of this converged environment safe um, is going to be one of the crucial, uh, the crucial questions going forward. Um, and I would end really where you began, which is ultimately, I think, the best thing that we can do is create converged networked environments where kids can live their lives and can thrive in ways um, that ultimately they learn how to keep themselves uh, uh, as safe as possible as we send them out into the deep end of these pools. So Dr. Byron, thank you so much for the extraordinary work you've done and all that it means uh, for us as parents and as people interested in this space. Thanks so much. about this a fair bit because, you know, I haven't seen Tanya for a while and she had to put up with some really intense meetings <laughs> that you look back on in sort of embarrassment, really, <laughs> in some respects. And I think I was definitely one of those. <laughs> but there was a group of us, really, of industry. And we have, a number of us, have feel very passionately about this. And I, I was at the Home Office today and the Minister, Vernon, Vernon Coker, said, well, child protection, it's a bit of a no-brainer, really, isn't it? You know, everybody wants to protect the children. And he's right. And, you know, I work in a company. I work... And people populate companies. And people have children in companies. And, you know, the industry is made up of people with families and children. And so, you know, we all care. Of course we do. And it is a no-brainer, really. Um, I mean, I kind of thought, well, well... Do I have to say good things about Byron? <laughs> I call it the Byron now, because I've depersonalised it from Tanya. <laughs> I can see what she's feeling about her, her surname. And I, and I kind of tried to be honest with myself, and I thought, well, actually, what was good for me about it was bringing the research together and bringing, uh, and for the first time, you know, really seeing a documentation about what needs to be done around schools and education. And, you know, I thought it was a really fantastic <coughs> piece. I was surprised, really, to be honest, how well that was done. So whoever did the chapter and worked with you on that, well done. And I kind of thought about the industry piece, and I thought, hmm, interesting. <laughs> and there's the talk about the... The council, there's the, you know, what's that going to be? And I guess, you know, from an industry perspective, can I say, how do we feel about Byron? What the Byron review and report? And I thought, well, actually, we don't know yet. The truth is, it's probably too early for us to really say, you know, what does it mean for industry? I've just finished two years of chairing the social networking guidance for the Home Office. And I've had 10 years on, I'm one of the, what do they call us today, veterans of the Home Office Task Force. 
So, you know, I've spent the best part of 10 years of my life with a couple of people in this room, uh, going to meetings, organising, doing all sorts of things. So I kind of feel a little out of sorts, really, and I just thought, well, I'm going to own that. I am out of sorts. I'm definitely out of sorts uh, with all of this going on around me, and for a number of reasons, really. And I, I thought, I'd, in a sense, this is more like a soliloquy from Annie, but I think there are some points to be made and things to be said that haven't been necessarily very well managed over the past few years. And I think I've got a boss um, in, the, in Vodafone, and you're going, oh, man, this is really hard. You don't know how hard it goes. Didums. And so I go, all right, yeah, I must remember, didums, you know, didums, it's so tough, you know. But, yeah, I can't, I've got to stop the moaning too much about all of this and remember the didums, you know, what a shame. It's so hard for you. And, uh, and I think today's a day of reflection because it was the last day of the Home Office Task Force. And I had some things, some of which I've said there, which I'll, I'll probably repeat, so a little bit boring for some of you. But um, I think one of the things that, for me, about going forward is that the council, what is this council? And there have been the questions, and you were well tipped off by Claudine about, oh, self-regulation, co-regulation is going to come up, you know, but that's been up for a while. And, um, and I've been thinking about that, thinking about, do we want codes? Why is it we're hung up about self and co-regulation? There are lots of discussions going on around the place. Um, <coughs> what happens to the guidance? And I'm a bit kind of thinking, well, I am a bit de dums actually, because you know I've been working for industry. I worked at Yahoo. I'm working at Vodafone on a global level, working with the EU, going to different countries, you know, sort of doing lots of stuff, which is fantastic to be able to have that kind of level of influence and and so forth. But actually, some of us have been working for ten years, in, particularly in the UK. You know, Camille's here, Nick's here. Uh, from an industry sp perspective, where we've done lots of stuff. We've made things happen, and I felt that this week when I saw the news report about Verizon and, I must say, is it Time Warner Cable and so forth, that were getting criticised by the Attorney Generals about child abuse images. And I kind of thought, I thought, well, actually, the UK businesses did this ages ago, actually. Several years ago, we implemented filtering, block lists, but you never hear anything about it. Does the public know? No. Is Tanya right that the, 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 you know, the public doesn't have any confidence? They don't know. They think that this terrible thing called the internet has arrived and it's chaos out there and they don't believe that the companies are doing things. Well, actually, we've been doing it for 10 years and we've been doing a lot. And, you know, the UK has got this kind of position of being a little bit smug or we're the world leaders and you hear you know, that trotted out by ministers and, and people. And I think, OK, we're world leading then as industry. That's good to hear. So, you know, what, what, what's, what's the problem? <laughs> and there are problems, and there will continue to be difficulties. We can't always anticipate how technology is going to be utilised. The mobile industry didn't think text was going to take off. We didn't. We didn't believe 60, was it 120 characters? We didn't believe it was going to be a huge business thing. We had no idea. Did we know chat rooms or social networking were going to be having paedophiles stalking on them or that children were going to be bullying each other? Well, it, it is, you know, human nature brings human nature to the internet, yeah? And we have to do something about that. And we have been doing things about that. And we've been doing these goddamn guidance for the Home Office for the last 10 years nearly on chat, on instant messaging, um, on moderation, on search, and now on... Uh, you know, social networking. Well, does anyone know about it in the public? No. Has the Home Office gone out and sent it to anybody? Has anybody sent it to all the MPs or tried to reach companies that weren't involved in the process? I don't think so. And I guess, you know, and that's my kind of beef with some of this, really, at the situation going forward, is actually we've done a heck of a lot. If we are world leading, then we deserve some credit. But we have got a situation and that the Byron Review has highlighted, where the public haven't got the confidence. It sounds like some of the politicians haven't got the confidence. We've had new entrants to the market where, you know, they brought new technologies, new things are happening, and it takes time to settle in, to, for those companies to mature a little bit. Some of us have been around a lot longer. Vodafone, you know, 30 years old. AOL, 10 years, or 11, 12 by now, maybe. And we're all at different points. And when I was doing the guidance, one of the things I had to do was I had to separate groups out, the stakeholders. It got too difficult, and we knew we wouldn't progress. And at one point, we were in a meeting with just industry people. 
and we let rip at each other. <laughs> but we wouldn't be able to do that in front of people. And that's where the mature companies, the companies that have been, you know, just entered or are resistant or are flying high, and that's where the kind of real peer pressure came to bear. That was the crunch point of drawing people into agreeing. And that's where we put our peer pressure on for things to happen. And it did happen. I can't talk about all of that. It is confidential, but it was painful and it wasn't, you know, it got really difficult and we had to do several bouts of that. Um, so, and, you know, should it be guidance, should it be codes? And that, that's another one of my beefs, really, if you like, my outs of sorts. Now, the guidance is whatever pages it is. Some of it was written to try and help particularly journalists and people that were trying to understand the issues a little bit in depth so that they didn't just run off with a couple of things from it. We thought we will explain things and it is, it is quite a heavy, I mean you have to be interested to want to read it, there's no doubt about it. Because, and it has got a lot of information there to help maybe journalists and people that come to it, um, industry, and, and also educate industry for the first time when it goes to these people. Maybe some of the players that are not in this room that are new to the marketplace who are trying to get to grips with uh, the the issues, we did write a very long piece so that they could just get it, for heaven's sakes, you know. And then there's about, I think there's about 50 something recommendations at the back, which goes from right through the defaults and registration and back end processes and what you should have up front. I mean, it's huge in terms of the recommendations for industry. Now, should that be a code? Should that be reviewed? I don't think it can be a code, so I'm here to tell you, I really, really don't believe the 50 recommendations that we've got in there can be a code. It can only be guidance, because the services and the technology is so diverse and so different and different services that it has to have some flexibility about what the right approach is and the solutions are. So if you go for the code approach, you'll end up with what I see, I saw the mobile framework code from uh, Madam Redding uh, launched a year, 18 months ago, well, it's a nice two-sider set of principles. And I think that's the kind of, you've got to weigh up what you really want. Do you want something that you can agree as industry? Yes, it took two years, but my God, if you look at the detail of it, you're not going to be able to transfer that to a code. It really are not, because it doesn't, it's not made to be a one-size-fits-all. It's about assessing your risk, getting you to acknowledge that you've got responsibility as industry, and then being able to apply the things that will work for your service to give you the flexibility and the shape to do that but at least we've written down what it is the key things are that can help you make this environment safer <coughs> if you have the will to do that to protect children at the end of the day it does come down to the will of each and every company on its own merit and on its own worth about what resources what time what energy it wants to put into this that's the way it is whether we should all be castigated I mean, my other bugbear is as a British company been around for a long time, you know, and we've, we've, you know, Vodafone is a little, we say we're a little world leader on child protection. We were the first to launch parental controls. We're trying to do the things that we think is our part in that kind of chain, you know, of the participants, be it parents, teachers, and, and whoever. We've got a, a role and we've got stuff to do, and we, we're doing that. There's no doubt about it. And we're trying to lead our industry. We, we see ourselves with that responsibility, and I think we take it very seriously. But then you get new entrants, and you know we've just acquired a, a social networking company from Denmark. Bless them, you know. I've been, there's not one security measure in sight at the moment, you know. But we're going to work that through. But that's the kind of the the genius of the innovation, the innovators, the small guys who have never thought about any of these issues. But and of course we can bring our you know knowledge and experience and all the stuff that we've got there to help them understand that. But they need a chance to to get to grips with that. So. From our point, we are trying to do our bit, and I think, you know, it's difficult when new entrants come, and at the moment, it's kind of US companies, isn't it? And if we do move, you know, what's self-regulation, what's co-regulation? We've been having these really intense debates, which have been quite fun, really. Um, it allows us to steam off a little bit, if I'm honest, but which we quite enjoy with the government officials. But, you know, but we are exasperated because we're having so many different reviews and so forth going on, and it is quite wearing. But um, 
you know, at the end of the day, you've got to have a framework. And I think the test of this about whether it will work is whether we can have the flexibility and the scope that self-regulation gives you because you own the solution. If it's a code and you want principles, I'm sure we can do that at quite a high, they will be quite a high level. And what you're in danger of losing is actually the granularity of the guidance that we've been developing and so forth. Um, <coughs> and I, I think there are difficult... I'm going to kind of go over two more minutes, but one thing is, you know, in the, in the UK framework and for British companies, and Vodafone is registered here as an example, our chief executive went to the uh, stock market analysts last year and said, you know, we've got confidence in the UK market, as an, you know, in terms of the regulatory regime. He went back this year and he actually said something quite different, which is we've got some concerns, actually, because there are about 15 or 16 reviews taking place. In other parts of Europe and in other markets, we've got four, you know, at the most. So there's a kind of, you know, what's going on here in the, in the greater regime of things about are we moving into a more regulatory sort of, you know, what's that going to do to the dynamics of the market? What's that going to do to sort of our investments? So in the sense of trying to pull together where industry is, I think we are responsive. I think some of us have been doing it for a long time. We do have to pressure and help and, you know, support our new entrant colleagues when they come along to it. And I did sort of want to try and end on a positive note, <laughs> de as I'm doing, but, uh, you know, I think this is a really important moment. We've got the summer to sort of reflect, and then we're kind of into these debates again, really, with the, you know, I'm kind of making the most because you're the target now, Claudine, and you're dodging well, I have to say. <laughs> But, you know, you know, this is the kind of tenor and it's a nice opportunity at the beginning of the summer to sort of begin to sort of reflect a little bit for you about where we're at. And, you know, just to show you what, because I think, you know, my worry is if we do move to co-regulation, it becomes a compliance checklist approach. Have we done it yet? End of. And what you've had for the past and the bit that's very hard to capture at the Home Office today is how much we've all worked together with you know, different stakeholders, be it charities, law enforcement, whatever. But there's been lots of spin-offs that will never be captured in terms of what that's brought. And it keeps us on our tippy toes as industry, you know, because we're trying to anticipate the next set of concerns. If it becomes, you know, where the regulator becomes the, the controller of that, well, we'll just let you define it and tell us, you know, oh, yeah, and we'll fight you and whatever. But I think we've been in a very different atmosphere here in the UK, which has allowed us to progress and it's allowed us to bring lots of people in. And, you know, this has been kind of one of the things we've, you know, positive thing that we've done this year is to launch all these companies have come together and, that, you know, there are American companies here, European companies, to sort of try and, you know, bridge this generational divide, which we've seen, you know, certainly Tanya's, you know, commented on in her report and saying we've known about for a long time. We know we've got to reach parents and teachers, but certainly industry, you know, it's had a plethora of websites and information for everybody. I mean, we're still developing them, but somehow we're still not reaching the targets and being able to give people the confidence, the knowledge and help them upskill for this. So we launched this and we did it as a cross, a pan-European approach to trying to help teachers. So it is particularly focused at teachers. Um, and, uh, We've kind of put all money in the pot together. It's funded by industry. We're certainly happy for other people to join us. This was Madame Reading in Brussels at our launch on the 24th of April. And I think that was very important for us to have that kind of support from the European Commission that they felt this was us stepping up to the plate. This was industry trying to do its bit and do something <coughs> constructive and positive to sort of address the issues. And this was a film that we did to sort of just really try and summarise and help teachers. And I think in terms of the website, it's probably been the best thing. It certainly seems to have touched a nerve with teachers for the first time in helping them understand the challenges that they're facing. So there you go.
pictures that you've put on Facebook. Not on Facebook.